Worf claims a door is jammed. Parthus is a green vegetable with fleshy roots. And Luda must have an amazing skincare regimen. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is hey. Ryan T. Husk. And today we are joined by Lisa Wilcox. We're very fortunate. How are you today, Lisa? I'm doing excellent. How about you guys? So good to have you. Yeah, pretty good. Pretty really, good. really is. Uh, one of the yeah. great joys of this show is getting to meet people like yourself that the fans for decades have said, remember this character? What about your, your trivia questions, your memories, your lessons that people point out later on in life? You know, and then so good to revisit you. How How's life? What's up with you? <laughs> life is great. <laughs> life is busy. Um, I left acting for a very long time, raising my children and whatnot, and got back into acting about, oh, about four or five years ago. Then, of course, we had the pandemic, <laughs> but um, anyway, um, it's been great. I've been, like, working, like, nonstop, honestly, so I'm very, very happy. Wow. I'll cut lots of film. Wow. Also, everybody, very quickly, do not forget Creation Entertainment, uh, March 8th through 10th, come early, March 7th through 10th in Burlingame, right next to the San Francisco airport, is Trek Tour, Trek to San Francisco. It's an amazing convention. Go to creationent.com. We're going to be there, that's for sure, as will dozens of Star Trek yes, celebrities. Sir. Go to <laughs> creationent.com for tickets, hotel, and more information. We will see you there. Srock, did you love this episode? I did. This was a lot of episode for me. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, so I had to really pay attention because they were introducing so many new concepts for me. I had to follow. This wasn't really, you know, the main ship uh, characters on the ship kind of having an, an adventure. This was more about your story, uh, Lisa, and, and also the, the story of this of this you know, Trelesta and the uh, Akamarians. And so I had to really sit down and like, and I like <laughs> this kind of stuff because it's it's world building. And I, I do enjoy uh, a good set of world building ideas. Excellent. Yeah, it was quite a story. And um, I don't know if you know this, but I'm actually a property on the Star Trek Next Gen Monopoly board. What? Oh, what? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, There's trivia all... for us. Think of the hundreds of guest stars that were on Next Generation, right? So believe yes. me, it was quite quite an honor to be a property on, on the board. Oh gosh. Wow. So yeah. How I mean, fitting I was too, my mom. Because yeah. I would say how fitting because in this episode you were kind of property of yes. uh, the main <laughs> lady. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, the sovereign. We got, so was. hey, your property. All right. <laughs> <laughs> so I was saying to my mom, you know, well, I don't have a star on Hollywood Boulevard, but I'm on the next gen Monopoly board. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's really cool. We got to find that. Everybody at home, find that for us and post it somewhere <laughs> like in our group or in the comments. Give us a link to it. Uh, yeah, Lisa... and it's so cool. I'm in the booklet and everything that tells the whole story. And anyway, wow. it's pretty neat. That's oh, incredible. That's uh <laughs> So your story, as everybody's, is always a little bit different. Everybody's got some kind of different story as to how they uh, auditioned their first impressions when they came on the show. Do you remember anything that really stood out the first time you came on the show? Were you wowed? Were you always a Star Trek fan? Or were you like, hey, it's just another job. These lines look cool. Let me nail it and get on to the next one. <laughs> uh, no, I have always watched Star Trek, even though the original I grew up with Star Trek, so uh, as many of us did, and so it was quite, uh, I was quite thrilled. Um, we filmed at Paramount Studios, which is, in my opinion, the most beautiful studio uh, I've, in the world. It's just absolutely gorgeous and full of, you know, history and all that. So to be on that lot was pretty, pretty special, definitely. And I was incredibly impressed with the soundstage sound stages, I should say. I mean, they literally build a planet. <laughs> I mean, you know, yes. it, it, it's, it's so, it's absolutely phenomenal. The meticulous uh, attention to detail 
is just incredible, which hence it's, you know, huge success, I think. Um, you know, even the gown, I, the dress I'm wearing that was custom made, the jewelry, there's so much thought put into, you know, how I have the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the tattoo here and the hair. I mean, just detail, detail, detail. So pretty, pretty uh, special experience. I want to compliment you um, on the performance that you gave in the scene with Riker, where you are kind of sent to his quarters to entertain him. And <laughs> I really enjoyed your performance there. I felt that you were playing this character really well with the reservations you had inside, with the kind of emotionless uh, persona that you were giving off and, and that you discussed in the scene. But, um, you know, it was the first time we really see Riker not taking the easy way and jumping on something that's in front of him. He actually <laughs> made, he actually <laughs> fought with a different part of his brain. <laughs> but I, that's what was special about it to me. It's like, oh, okay, this guy actually, you know, it, it, you, you brought out a certain... Um, characteristic in Riker that we we that I as the audience felt was great um can you tell me a little bit about working with Mr. Jonathan Frakes uh and and how your your chemistry was um you know so tangible on, on screen uh well thank you Glenn for the the compliment um Utah was a very uh layered character needless to say so it was certainly, um, so I'm glad my objective to make it believable and that there's just levels and levels going on with this woman. Um, and uh, Jonathan, we had we had a great time. Uh, he's very tall. He's very <laughs> tall. And, and I'm like 5'4". I think back then I was 5'5", five five, actually. <laughs> now I'm 5'4". <five> <laughs> As time travels, right, guys? Um, so they had to put, so when we, we get to ki we kiss, right? And they had to put me on an apple box. <laughs> so, Half apple, so, quarter know, apple, full it. apple. Yeah. Uh, it might have been a full apple, I think. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Just a foot, a foot and a half, yeah. Um, so, uh, but we, we hit it off immediately. Um and there was chemistry. And also what you said about Riker's care about Riker, you know, I really see it as he was falling in love with me. There was something he, you know, we definitely were falling in love with each other, which makes the end so much more tragic, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. Uh, yeah. So whenever I do see him at a convention, he always goes, he always says, ah, Utah, Harthas a la Utah. <laughs> <laughs> So he has never forgotten our uh, the experience, you know, or that episode. So that's pretty cool. Um, we did have something kind of happen on set, though, when we were, he's eating my parthus, right? So yeah. it's like the green jello thing, okay? And he's eating it, and the director goes, what? And we're like, what? Well, the green dye food coloring they used on the jello was staining his teeth. So we had to stop <laughs> filming for like an hour for them to get this green stuff off of his beautiful teeth. We were not happy. <laughs> anyway, and I have a feeling someone's head rolled that day, whoever made that part of this anyway. So, uh, so I, I, I noticed how he was picking at it with his fork. Yes. <laughs> it's, the way he did it was, it's not the way you pick at something you really like or you yeah. want to eat that much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah he learned his lesson he learned his lesson yeah, yeah. wow so, that's funny uh, and these things happen on you know things happen on set it's just part of the part yeah. of the deal you of know course. Yeah. Well, we can't so, have green teeth walking around so that you know, no, that would be no. yeah <laughs> i think they had to use peroxide eventually anyway it oh, was quite sounds, a work deal. <laughs> sounds terrible i was <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. What plus, was some of the you don't want to be staining the star's teeth, okay? No. <laughs> Plus, there was a moment in the scene with you where uh, at the end of the scene, Riker gives this big, slow smile. Like, it starts off kind of a smirk, and then it gets bigger, bigger, bigger. And that is 
an actual meme. It's like a GIF that people use all over the internet. If you go on like Twitter or Facebook and you just go into GIFs and you do Riker, one of the very first things you'll always see is that one, but it's in slow motion. So he's like, oh, oh, and it's just, I love it. and as I'm watching the scene, I'm like, this looks like it's going to be that scene. Like you recognize the framing. So I'm like oh, waiting for it with bated breath. Right. And I'm like trying to listen to what you are saying to deliver to him to get that smile. And you're just mesmerizing him is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, I am definitely going to look up that GIF. Oh my goodness! Yes, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, I, I I thought you were really great in this episode because you were playing this um, conflicted person that had a little. It felt came across as reserved or shy, and you know, um, there's so much going on inside of you that we later learn is you know your objective in life and what you basically, you know, being trained to be an assassin essentially right here yeah. um and so but we don't know that and we know that you have this kind of the servant thing is what they really gave us an entryway into so i really thought that was dynamic and i wanted to ask you because this is what i thought of when i was watching your performance i thought of one of my favorite movies which is blade runner the mm. original blade runner with harrison ford and in that film there was a character named Rachel, played by an actress named Sean Young, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. Oh, I yeah. The film very, very well. Yes. Definitely an element of Rachel in Utah. Absolutely. I, I felt that. I felt even almost the hair, the hmm. hair design was not the same, but similar. And yes. the performance of just this kind of stoic, I can't really read what's going on. I, I really th thought there were, you know, remnants of that uh, performance from Blade Runner in this character, which I which I love, by the way. So another compliment for you, Lisa. Wow, thank you. I never it never um, occurred to me. So thank you. That's a huge compliment. You know, because oh, Rachel is just such a fascinating character in Blade Runner. Oh, she's just intriguing. You know, iconic. Yes. Speaking yes. of intriguing, yeah. check this out. So here's the, uh, here it is right here. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love it. That's great. Um, that is great. Oh, also, man. everybody at home, here's a bit of trivia for you. Do you know that Lisa is currently working with somebody that appeared in Star Trek Picard season three? What? How, how's that what? possible? Well, if you follow the Lisa Wilcox, you would know, look at this, uh, with Tiffany Shepes, who played Dr. Oak, I believe, in Star Trek Picard. I believe she's married to Sean Tretta, if I remember correctly. And so can you tell us what this is? Oh, this is called, this is a totally campy horror film uh, called slasher size and it takes <laughs> and, and it takes place in the 80s and there's a killer on the loose killing people at gyms <laughs> uh, it's we had so we you, i'm so happy i haven't even put up the pictures i have for that because we just filmed it friday <laughs> um so anyway and we're the um we're the board we're no nonsense, you know, final girls kind of thing. So we we take care of the situation. No worries, everybody. The world is now safe. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, then we had a good time. <laughs> Amazing. I, I I wanted to ask you also, Lisa. You mentioned that you walked away from acting, and I mean, you started really. We, we saw your credits go back, you know, to the eighties, and um. So to be putting in all that work and all that time, and I, I just wanted for the audience to understand, you know, the decision that you made to walk away from it, to, as you say, raising children, and um, how was that experience for you, um, either getting into another profession or not working at all, um, and focusing on family? I mean, what, what, what was that like for you? It was it was tough because I kind of left at sort of at the top of at the 
you know, kind of the very beginning top of my career. Um, but I got married and I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to be a room mom. And once the, I had two boys and but one, and I remember I did um, in Vancouver, went to Vancouver for a few months to do uh, the TV series, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure. And my young, my eldest, he was young enough, you know, we could, I, I could go around places with my family, you know what I mean? But once I started school, mm, no, I, I just didn't want to do that. I wasn't going to, I wanted to be home. And my husband at the time, um, he was doing well in his profession. So um, I got to be, a, you know, a housewife, basically. So, which was a, you know, a, a great thing. Um, but of course I always miss acting. Um, so I was really excited to win an opportunity. And I did corporate world for like five years when kids were older. Um, but I decided, you know what, my passion is acting. So mm -hmm. let's do that and let's be brave. <laughs> okay. Mm. And yeah. fortunately the, the, uh, you know, producers and writers and all that, it, welcome arms so i you know make my living as a full-time actress so uh mm -hmm. knock on wood i'm very grateful for for that that's incredible and, and at an older now at an older age you know not obviously not the ingenue anymore um i'm getting to play really fun evil people evil politicians evil queens, you know, all that, which is so much fun. Oh my gosh. It's so much fun to sink my hands into those kind of roles. Mm -hmm. Well, we only have you for a couple yeah. more minutes, uh, Lisa. First of all, I just want to say your performance uh, as Luta is very impressive because you're, you're playing an alien, right? Which <laughs> feels so nebulous. You're playing an alien, but I'm sure if you were to ask a director, okay, or a writer, so how do these aliens, they'd be like, I, I don't know, just kind of like humans, I guess, but with stuff on their face and nefarious. <laughs> things. So it's kind of this confusing thing of like, well, am I acting like an alien? Am I acting like a human? I have a thing on my head and another thing, and I don't know what's going on. But but you, you're clearly able to shine human motives and human emotions through it, which is what makes you know this performance so amazing but uh i think i said luta it's utah uh utah. but moving forward since we only have you a minute or two here can you please tell everybody you're you're working constantly what where can they find you what are the the newest projects to look out for well there's five maybe six things streaming right now and you can look on hulu uh prime um, you know, all of them, uh, Amazon Prime, you know, uh, I'm very excited about one called um, Don't Suck. And I work <laughs> with Jamie Kennedy, the comedian Jamie Kennedy, and uh, Matt Riff to Matt Rife. Uh, so, what a great time. I was so nervous to work with, I mean, Jamie, a professional comedian, I was so nervous. Because then the director, who I've known for a long time, he said, so we're going to do the script, but also Jamie's want to do some improv, which I anticipated. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I'm going to improv Mediums. on Jamie Kennedy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and I was so I'm on set and I'm dressed and all this. And I'm, <laughs> I'm literally like so nervous. I'm shaking. And Jamie goes, are you cold? And I'm like, yes, <laughs> I'm cold. <laughs> Can we get Lisa a jacket? You know? <laughs> Oh, anyway, so after we finished filming and everything, I told him, you know what? I was shaking because I was so nervous. He's like, it's just little me, Lisa. It's just Jamie. This and that. Anyway, he was totally down to earth. Totally, totally adorable. Um, so that's playing also something called um, Murder Anyone, where I won uh, Best Supporting Actress, actually, at a festival in Hollywood. Uh, Murder Anyone. Um, also a movie called Mystery Spot. Uh, big lead role. Very proud of that character. Mm -hmm. um, the Black Mass. I, the Black Mass. Black Mass. Yes, that's out now. Uh, and that was actually at the Cannes Film Festival. Um, so, yeah, there's lots of lots of stuff out there. <laughs> and that's amazing. more to come, I will tell you. Now, I know we have, do we have two more minutes? Can I tell a quick story? Sure. Okay. Yeah. So I have to tell you, Patrick Stewart, Picard. So... Um, a few years later, I'm sadly getting a divorce and whatnot. I'm looking for a house to rent. 
And I found this adorable Spanish bungalow in Burbank. And the realtor, my realtor is talking to the other realtor and put it together that I'm Utah from Star Trek because this house, this little bungalow is where <laughs> is where he was, Patrick was living with his fiance, Wendy, in this house. They were living in her house while they were building their palatial mansion in Pacific Palisades, right? So, so anyway, I get the house. A lot of people wanted the house. I get the house. And uh, Patrick and his wife drive up in a, uh, he's being driven in a white van because he was in Han Anaheim doing an autograph show. Went up and he gets out. Lisa, how are you, darling? <laughs> la, 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 right? Oh, it was so cool. And so, so they're showing me the ins and outs of the house and, and whatnot. And it was so funny because his, his <laughs> fiance is like, Patrick, you need to fix this gate. You forgot to fix the gate. Or what? <laughs> it was just, it was so real. It was so surreal, really. Um, anyway, it was, it was great. And then I move in and I'm kind of like, I'm in the bedroom looking at this, you know, I'm going to sleep going, Patrick Stewart stared at the ceiling. Stewart, you know he did. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's my fun little story. <laughs> wow. Oh, that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure you've seen each other or the uh, the next generation cast since you know at conventions and things of that nature. Yes. Um, since, since the recording of this, right? So you always yes. get a chance to kind of uh, reconnect. You mentioned. Uh, Jonathan Frakes uh, mentioning the Parthas. <laughs> That's he, whenever he sees me, he's like, a la Utah. Parthas a la Utah. <laughs> a la Utah. <laughs> and he laughs and we laugh and, and whatnot. Wow. So what, what a great cast. What a great cast. It was just, it was an honor. So fun group. And thank you. Thank you for enjoying the episode, The Vengeance Factor. Great title. Thank you, uh, Lisa. Thank we you. really appreciate you squeezing a little bit of time in your extremely busy schedule. Uh, you're constantly working and we really appreciate it. So thank you so much for hanging out with us. Thank you. I know I've got I had three movies back to back. I just did one of them. So that's one wow. of four, but three more like back to back, like home a day, leave the next day. So I'm getting oh, wow. my memorization brain in gear. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you work a lot, it means you're good at what you do. So yep. I'm, Oh. That's the confirmation. Um, <laughs> Thank you. We're going to second that as well from, from what we saw in this episode. You did a fantastic job, Lisa. We we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you, guys, very, very much. All right, Thanks and everybody, having... thank you, really, really appreciate it. Everybody at home, stick around. We're going to come right back on The Seventh Rule. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome back to The Seventh Rule with Ciroc Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk. Lisa was amazing. Thanks very much to her for hanging out with us. Tons of fun. Yeah. Um, here are the trivioids of the week because the fans have been clamoring for them. And by clamoring, I mean waiting patiently while I get through them. <laughs> Worf <laughs> claims a door is jammed. The Akamarians, that's what it was. The Akamarians would suggest the gatherers there is a gatherer encampment somewhere in the Hiromi cluster. Parthus is a green vegetable with fleshy roots. The salvage value of neuranium allow is... I need to spell check myself. The salvage value of neuranium alloy is quite low. In 20 days, Picard hopes to be very far from the Hiromi cluster. Utah was one of the clan Trelesta. Brule grabs Wesley's homework, and Utah must have an amazing skincare regimen. Why did I call her Luta? It's Utah. Um, because she stayed young for so long. You know. Anyway, so yeah. that was, uh, I'll tell you what I liked about this episode first and foremost. There are a lot of things. Production design, which uh, Lisa mentioned, and um, but the the writing was different than what we are accustomed to with writing. There were some twists, there were some turns, and I'll just point out one thing that that I noticed kind of towards the end, which was usually in Star Trek we are uncovering the mystery with 
the characters. You know, there's a mystery bit by bit by bit. We're uncovering the mystery. And then the final minutes we go, aha, it was actually Utah, right? But in this case, the writers let us know the answer to the mystery. We knew it was Utah that did. I mean, we didn't really know why as much, you know, whatever, but mainly we knew who it was and we watched yeah. the characters figure it out as we know. So it's just kind of a, a different point of view where rather than us trying to figure out what's going on, we're watching the characters try to figure it out. It's just different writing style, but it's very interesting when it happens. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, different writing style. I did. I did sense that the, the thing that was difficult for me in this episode was following all of the <laughs> all of the plot lines. It, I I love the world building, and I love that you know we're getting to meet new, you know, civilizations, species, what, what have you. But the thing that is difficult for me is when I keep getting a whole bunch of people to pay attention to, and they're really not that relevant to the story. And so <laughs> totally. I was writing know, down all these names too. <laughs> yeah. I'm writing down names. I'm like, uh, Chor, Chorgon and, uh, Bruel and, you know, Tamarick. And I'm just writing all of these names and I'm realizing Volnada, Vol, Volnada or whatever. Uh, the you know the the guy that she killed in the beginning yeah. who looked a lot like a Borg to me. I was like, where did this Borg guy come from? <laughs> what was his name? Volnath, Volnath, Volnath. and yeah, Volnath. Temerick yeah. and and Q Kerman and Chorgon, yeah, and... the the statue Horgon. You got Brul, Utah. Yeah, that's true. Maruk. It, it was too many names. Too many names. Too many characters being introduced. And, and that made it very difficult for me to follow because I'm trying to think, okay, is Volnoth an important person to know? Why, why do I have to know Volnoth? Then it's Brul, and, and then it's his, his servant Tamarek, his, or, and then it's like, go tell Chloron, and go tell that guy, and Claire Clorox, and, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, guys, I don't know what's going on here anymore. Uh, they got to keep it a lot more simple than the Akamarians and the clans and the this and the that. It was very complex as opposed to a really simplified this is a uh you know an ancestral familiar beef between two groups it makes sense we've seen that with the i, I keep the, the, those famous uh irish names they call you know the the clans that always fought each other what was the name of them the ah man I don't know. yeah it, it'll come to me uh, it's a famous Ma beef between. between not, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know, know if it's an Irish about. name or American thing, but it, there's a famous like beef between the the McCoys and the the Hatfields, the Hatfields and McCoys. Isn't that? A, isn't I don't that? know. I feel like that's like musical theater or something. Let me look that uh, up. I, thought, I don't know. It was like a. I don't know. I just recognize it. two families and stuff. That's what I thought. But oh no, you're right. Yeah. Hatfield McCoy feud. Involved two American families of the West Virginia, Kentucky area. No good ever comes from that. <laughs> Along the Tug Fork of the Big Sandy River from 1863 yes. to 1891. Yeah, good knowledge. Yeah. So that's like, this was like the Hatfield and McCoy kind of, uh, you know, clan beef. Um and so that's where I thought, you know, I could have gotten this story reduced a lot less. The other thing, for example, this negotiator woman that was in charge of the thing, I I was thinking she was somehow involved in this plot, right? And to see that she wasn't was a little bit disappointing for me because she seemed ruthless to me almost. I know a, why. I know why. And I got yes. this. The, yes. Okay. This week on Ryan thought of Ciroc when Ryan thought of Ciroc when uh, Maruk was introduced and I was like, ah, TNG's Kai Wen. Yes. <laughs> she had yes. very Kai Wen vibes, but they yes. didn't quite give her that umph of the Kai kill. Wen. The kill. It's like. It, it was almost like a red herring. Like you see her, you're like, all right, there's something, something going on here. Yes. And they're like, no, 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 she's, she's pretty chill. She's, she's just kind of doing her thing. Yeah. 
And I was pissed <laughs> about that yeah. because I'm like, Kai Wynn is way more devious than that. And yeah. she's, she, she would be in on it. You know, she would act like she has no idea. And like, Oh, how dare you, uh, Utah for betraying my knowledge. I had no idea. Wink, wink, <laughs> you know, but you're going to have to die and I'm going to keep the, keep it going. I, I really felt Kai win. As soon, actually, I had this pause. I was like, is that Kai win? Is that Kai win? Um, I had to really look. Um, but yeah, it left me kind of dissatisfied that the Maroop character wasn't involved in this. Um, it seemed like, you know, it would be the case because mm -hmm. she's exactly leading her to all of her enemies. Like, what are the chances that this character, um, Utah, would be the servant of somebody that would exactly lead them through these certain steps, including the Federation's help, uh, to enlist in order to get all of her enemies? And well, that's that why seems... she was waiting for 53 years, I guess. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I don't know if it was just the casting where they cast a lady to play Maruk that has a little bit behind the eyes where you kind of think, is she in on, you know, like, I don't know if it was the casting where they cast somebody that usually can portray something a little bit more sinister than what the character called for, or if it's just right. that we're conditioned after having watched Deep Space Nine and, and, and that she just looks similar. So we just made that connection ourselves. I'm not sure. But I had the same feeling you did, where I was like, she's going to be like, oh, we want to be your friend, you know, while meanwhile, her foot's like stomping on the face of another guy, you know, kind of thing where yeah. she's like pulling the yeah. shirt. But she ended up just being like, no, nah, you know, I just I just want to be friends and I have a little temper. Oopsie. But but overall, I just want to be nice to these people, by the way, yeah. you know. Give a man a fish, feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you know, right? She did that thing where yeah. she's like, we we will allow you to build and feed and clothe yourselves. I was like, wow, she's all wise and friendly. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, there's a catch here. There's a catch here. There's a catch here. And I was waiting for the catch and there was no catch. And that kind of, I don't know, that could have been done better for me. That would have added um, because, another layer, yeah. Yeah, because she... I felt an animosity. There was a disdain there for these people. She actually was looking down at them with this like, you barbaric people. And mm -hmm. and it's hard for me for somebody to think if you, if you approach your adversary, not thinking of them as equals or as human or whatever that race of people is. If you don't think of them as that, and you think of them as, uh, subservient or less than that then you would probably not reach a negotiating point that would be fair you would be trying to hustle them or trick them and so right. i didn't I, I didn't think that meshed well the fact that she had such a disdain but she was also being very noble it didn't mm -hmm. now that nothing. that brings up a point that i wanted to ask you um something very interesting to me was when we first meet the Akamarians, mm -hmm. they're barbarians. They look like they stink. When the guy came up to Wesley on the bridge, my first thought was, poor Wesley. I bet you Wesley's going, oh, this guy stinks. Like for some reason, they, you know, they they dirtied them up. They gave him this leather. I'm like, I'm sure he was going like, oh, geez, why is this? Can you stand over there? But like, so they introduce us to kind of like, and, you know, they're kind of jerks to each other, but also in like a fun, jostly way. But the point is that she wants to, Maruk wants to make peace. These guys are bad guys. They do horrible things, but she still wants to open up and make peace with them. What a wonderful human she is or whatever she is. And, you know, what a, how gracious of her, you know, Mother Teresa over here. But as the episode progresses, we start to find the other guys to be much more sympathetic. Like they are willing to negotiate. They do want a better life. They are being reasonable. They, you know what I mean? Like suddenly mm -hmm. it, they really humanize them in that way. And I thought that was really interesting, but 
did you feel that swing where suddenly you're kind of rooting for them? Um, I, I don't know if I was rooting for them so much. I, I, I can't feel myself like totally rooting for them because they kind of made them appear to be unintelligent people. And what, what, what kind of got to me a little bit was that these people had moved on throughout this rift, whatever this rift that they had between each other, these clans, they had moved on and I guess conquered other planets or migrated to another planet. Mm -hmm. And several planets away, like one group was on one planet and they had to go take that group from this planet and go over to another planet to meet uh, Shorgon or whatever it was. And, you know, so take they, me away. Yeah. So they're spread out over a, a large amount of distance is what I mean. And so if I had my own planet to myself. Right. Would I really want to just give it up so I can go get a piece of land over back over there when we've already migrated and moved farm. on. It's like, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't right. understand the, the allure of that. Like, why would we want that? Unless that, that land had ancestral value for us, unless it was like a religious kind of place, like a holy place for us, there would be some, have to be something attached to that land that would make me want to even go there. Otherwise, I've become a, a pack led type of group of people that go around stealing and collecting right. what I need. I have my own land to do it. I have autonomy here. I have my own governance here. I have my own structure here. Why exa exactly would I want to go to join in to be a one a seat on a board of five seats or whatever the number is? And lose my autonomy, lose my reign over myself, and you know my emancipation. I would say, why would I give up my emancipation to be uh, to struggle to fit into this version of of a society that you've built? I don't right, understand. and that's exactly what the, the negotiation was about. Which is, look, maybe they're a little tired of the struggle. Maybe they do want a, some kind of reunification to, you know, bring their races back together, but it needs to work. It needs to make sense. It can't just be doing it and going and being subservient to someone else. I mean, that's that's last place on what they want. Um, and that's why that brings me to what I thought was actually the most interesting line in this episode. I really liked it a lot. Um, it was when Chargon Take Me Away said... We will need autonomy. And Maruk is all pissed. She's like, autonomy? Barf. And then Picard says, if we can at least acknowledge that Chargon appears willing to discuss your offer. And I thought that was such a good line because he's saying, have some perspective. You're focused already. You're already getting mad about the details rather than looking that, realizing that on the big picture, You've already got to win. He's already willing to negotiate. That's that's ninety percent of the problem. Is are they willing to negotiate? They are. The rest is just ironing out the details. So I thought that was a really good piece of perspective, and I, I liked it a lot. Uh, yeah, it's good stuff there for me. Yeah, um, I, I I like the scene um, between Riker and Yuta. Um, and what I really liked about it was we saw that Riker's instincts are naturally to, Hey, if you want to have sex, let's do it. Like that's, we've seen him do that many times. So we know that that's <laughs> his, his go-to move, right. Yeah. In those yeah. situations. So we were expecting it. I was at least, I was like, Oh, he's, he's totally down. But yeah, when Riker really walks in, he's like, well, well, what do we do? Oh, Hey, yeah. He's like, suddenly she I'm says, interested I in this mission. You? Yeah, he's <laughs> sitting back. She's like, am I disturbing? He's like, no, actually, yeah. not at all. I'm mm. waiting for somebody. This is my favorite my mission ever all of a sudden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, but what I really liked about that scene was, number one, Riker does have a standard. And that standard is he doesn't want somebody who's uh, subservient or in a 
um, a required state where it's like, mm-hmm. you know, I have to do this because I was told I have to do this. He wants somebody who wants him because they think he's a handsome hunk of a guy. That's what he wants. But if it's direct orders, he doesn't want it from orders and he doesn't want it from a place yeah. of subservience. He's like, like that's not like hot. It. <laughs> yeah. Like, how is that hot? Way to ruin yeah. the mood. Oh, you have to? Oh, yeah. Boy, gee, this is, yeah. this is hot. <laughs> so when he said, I prefer the company of equals, I thought that was really a great line um, for me. That's what jumped out to me. And, and then, and then especially when he followed up and said, she said, you know, something about equals. And he said, yes, especially in the matters of love, right? especially when it's somebody I have love with. I want it to be an equal footing. I don't want it to be uh, where I'm in a position of usury or taking advantage of something. And that's a good skill, a quality that Riker has shown in this particular moment that I'm glad that we didn't just go to the usual, um, you know, Riker just wants to sleep with her. He actually showed that he has morals that he has a red line that he has certain lines that he won't cross so i thought that showed a a lot of integrity on his part Mm -hmm. and she's like noted he likes to give and then she walks away and he's like no no but don't leave yeah we could still work this out i mean let's not be too hasty about this yeah Riker is i just love that smirk that grin that he always had you're like all right this guy he's just always Um, so there are a few other things real quick. Uh, I did love that they were both willing to negotiate. That was of course, great. Um, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but it felt like maybe it was just the height difference, but it felt like when Riker and Utah were together, it felt like he was just constantly looking at her forehead. <laughs> I, don't <know. laughs> I don't know. That was just my imagination. Uh, but he was, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with well, this. Well, if, if, we're, if we're doing nitpicks, I guess, you know, I had a nitpick that was at the end of the scene that I'm raving about because I, I really like the scene, but then it ended very weird because in the end, he's, she's like, oh, okay, well, I guess you don't want me. And he's like, no, no. And he kind of grabs her. He, he puts her head on, her, on his chest and he kind of turns her head in there and he's like, just stay here for a second, right? And then the red alert sign comes on and he walks out of there, looks at her, doesn't say anything like, uh, I'll be back. There's an emergency. I got to go. Nothing. He just looks at her like and walks out. And I'm dude, like, he's such a dude, player, dude. He's He plays dude. the game so hard, dude. He's like, no, no, no. Say so. We better not. And then she goes, okay, then I'll leave. He's like, no, 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 but but come here. And, you know, yes. and then he gets a call and he's like, uh, sorry, got to go. And and told, <laughs> she's just constantly like, wait, yes. does he doesn't do it? He, he loves me. He <laughs> yes. loves me not. He loves me. He loves yes. Me Yo, can I get some exit lines, <laughs> right? Or something like uh you wait here. I'll be right back. You know, was, I don't know. There was just, it was nothing. He just left it hanging. And I thought, wow, well, that, that's Tell not really it. any closure. I have no idea. <laughs> but uh, which reminds me very quickly about one of my ultimate pet peeves in TV and movies. I, I it, it just drives me bananas. No TV show, no movie. Nobody ever says goodbye when they hang up on the phone. They're having a oh, two-hour conversation with their friend, and they're like, okay, yeah, did you get the thing? Yeah. Click. or so, you're, I'm like, nobody, I mean, just a pet peeve, and nobody ever says, cool, <laughs> bye, see ya, bye. You know, even on Star Trek, they're never like, great over and out or something they just say acknowledge and then they just i don't know it's just a weird thing where you'll notice no they're so rude on the phone i've never just hung up on somebody without some kind of bye see you later talk to you. nothing yeah i, I don't just yeah. be like okay so you're available at 3 30 tomorrow yeah great click no i don't do that i say cool see you then bye <laughs> anyway yeah, I have I have a I have a whole nother set of nitpicks too that we're gonna do on the other side. But all right, uh, yeah, yeah, 
I, I totally, I, I get a bunch of nitpick moments too. Home run there of the episode. What do you think, Ciroc Lofton? Who gets the home run of the episode? Why can't I get this thing right? There we go. Oh, TNG home run of the episode will, I'm going to give it to Utah, um, to Lisa Wilcox. I thought she did a good good job in this episode. At first I was like, who is this person? Um, and she did eventually shine and rise to the top as the episode went along. Um, kind of started off like, oh, I wonder if this somebody I have to pay attention to. And then it was. And mm-hmm. I thought, I thought when her moment called, she really stepped up and um, hit the home run. Yeah, I agree. It was really interesting because she kind of starts off as like a tertiary character and then suddenly turns out to be like the central figure. Like, you know, she's the the key element to all this, which was nice to have, you know, that that twist. Because a lot of times Star Trek, they'll they'll have an, a main person of the week and then one or two other people that have a couple of lines that just hand them things. but Every once in a while, that other person ends up being the main person in the story, which was really cool. And of course, Lisa nailed it. Uh, Really liked it. I thought it was very well done. Plus, plus you always expect the bad guy to be an overtly acting bad guy, like one of those characters. They were all kind of acting tough and macho, and you were thinking, okay, maybe he's the bad guy. Maybe he's the bad guy. And it turns out the bad guy was the prettiest you know, softest spoken person in the episode. So I, I yeah. like that. Oh, yeah, she was pretty. Good point. Uh, all right. Uh, we also want to... Oh, these people are all very pretty too, by the way. Very special thanks to Homer Frizzell, Dr. Anne-Marie Seagull, Eve England out in Wales, Yvette Blackman, Tom, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri. I wonder if I should be mad at him right now because of the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's partying still. Uh, our buddy Titus Moeller, Dr. Muhammad Noor, Tierney C. Diekman, Anil O. Palat, Joe Balserati, Mike Goo, Dr. Stephanie Baker, Carrie Schwent, Faith Howell, Edward Foltz, My Live from Tokyo, The Matt Boardman, Chris McGee, Justin Weir, Jake Barrett, Henry Unger, Allison Leach Hyde, Julie Manisfi, Marsha Classic Schreier, Greg K. Wickstrom, I think that's how you do a K in sign language, if I remember correctly. Jed Thompson, Susan V. Gruner, Glenn Iverson, Dave Gregory, Tim Baum, and of course, the man, the myth, the legend, Jason Oaken. All right, everybody, stick around. We've got our free-for-all up next, so don't you touch that dial (laughs) on the seventh rule. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the free for all time with Melissa Longo. Hello. We've got (laughs) Jason M. Oaken with a rad poster behind him. Carrie Schwent is wearing one of our favorite Star Wars psych Star Trek shirts. (laughs) Uh, Greg Kenzo is almost matching me. He's got his Cisco version. I've got my Picard version. You can get that at theintrovertedrepublic.com. Same with Melissa's shirt, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri and Allison Leach Hyde are matching today. Look at that. Be kind. That's bekindmerch.org, if I remember correctly. Chase Masterson. Mm-hmm. That is the Kenneth Mitchell variety. And the Dark Lord, yeah. Chris McGee, will teach us things. <laughs> well, first things first, Jake Cisco guesses the IMDb score. I'm going to give it a, a 6.6. 6. Mm. That's right. That's my guess. Now, does anybody have, have any guesses that doesn't already know, though? That's the key. I, I looked. Same. Okay, Riker. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Everybody peaked. <laughs> All right. Sounds like a rave. Um, it was a six point five spot know, on so straw. Close. Very good. Um, nice. Okay. What about non-appearance mentions? Did we get any of those? I didn't hear any. Same. All right. 
Well then, Melissa Longo, would you please get us started off on the right track? Let us know, what did you think of this particular episode? Well, this episode definitely kept my attention. Um, it was interesting. I, I got different tonalities from this episode. Um, a mix between Terminator, Blade Runner, Mad Max, and 80s hair slash metal bands. <laughs> fun. <laughs> that was the fun part. Um, and I really like the twist of uh, Yuda being the murderer and her being the example of the moral of this episode, which I took to be vengeance serves no one. <laughs> However, <laughs> I think that Riker killing Yuda it uh, doesn't really, it, it wasn't an effective button for that point. And I think they could have explored that in a different way um, rather than him killing her to prove that murder is bad. So, you know, <laughs> murder and murder, yeah. yeah. They don't cancel each other out. Anyway, um, Kai Wynn. I got Kai Wynn from The Sovereign vibes from her and I kept expecting her to be the orchestrator of the vengeance plot and what a twist she wasn't she really wanted a piece of that I, I thought that was that was fun um and um the guy that Yuda plays or kills that we see Yuda kill mm -hmm. um we see him later in a later Deep Space Nine episode called Bada Bing Bada Bang. He's Mr. Yep. Zemo, the casino owner. <laughs> wow. Cool. Yeah. And he's also um, Vinny the Cannon Damati in The Big Easy. <laughs> so if you ever seen, watch The Big Easy, that's fun. But um, I have a lot of other things to say later. But overall, I, I didn't think this episode was too shabby. Mm -hmm. Yuda. Last name, man. Well, uh, Melissa, you definitely echoed a lot of the sentiments Sorok and I had about Kai Wen. We're like, when is she going to do something evil? But she never did. She's not evil. Kai Wen ruined us for yeah. everyone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, up next is Kai Oaken. Uh, Jason, <laughs> what did you think of this particular episode? Well, it's it certainly, as Melissa said, it's, it does keep your attention. It's entertaining. It moves along pretty fast. I mean, in some ways, it's you can think of it as a filler type episode. I mean, there are some themes here, but it's not exactly uh, necessarily sort of at a high sort of level of science fiction or anything else for that matter. It does have a message, uh, which is good to see. I think it's a pretty good looking episode. I, I think it was shot pretty well. Uh, by timothy bond i mean we do see you know uh s the way especially uh planet hell was shot i mean he did use sort of both levels of the set and it, it it looked very nice and i think it was lit pretty well as well very uh uh kind of detailed lighting typically not something you see on next gen which is lit very very brightly but i suppose that's the uh function of the sets that they used you know uh I think, you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, why do all the aliens have to look like, you know, like they're in the biker gang and, you know, the, the mullets and everything else sort of, they, it, it does have sort of this 1980s feel to it for sure. And then, you know, Sam Rolfe, who, uh, who has the writing credit on the episode, it was around, has been around for a long time and obviously had connections to Gene Roddenberry through Have Gun Will Travel and uh, they, uh, their paths crossed many, you know, many times. So that's probably how he ended up doing this, but he, he was at it for a long time before he, you know, uh, was working on uh, on this episode of Next Gen. So there's a lot of history there. Again, it's entertaining. There are certain things in it that we'll, I want to talk about later that could have been done differently. Uh, I think the performances were generally good. I did like Nancy Parsons' performance, and I know this Kai Wynn vibe. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's the outfit. Maybe it's that... Uh, <laughs> Maybe it's a sort of yellow outfit. And uh, with her, I, I can't get past, you know, Miss Bulberker and, and Porky's, if you've seen that one. It's kind of hard to break from that uh, particular character. Uh, but I think she did a marvelous job. Uh, I think Lisa Wilcox, Lisa Wilcox uh, uh, was very good in it. Uh, I think Stephen Lee kind of over, I was a little over the top. I didn't particularly enjoy his performance. I think he was a little... 
be even a little too big on it. Uh, but overall, I think certainly the regulars were pretty good. I think, you know, uh, Frakes was good in it and uh, Will Wheaton was good in it. So, again, entertaining, kind of a filler. Certain things could have been done better, and I'll talk about them later. Nice. Excellent. Who was that That guy? Was he the one that played the boss, the the leader? That's right. Okay. Got it. Uh, Kerry Schwent, a.k.a. Crafty Bear out in space. What's up, Kerry? What would you think of this episode? Well, this one's it's fun. It's kind of kind of middle of the road. Don't don't love it. Don't hate it. But yeah, like Malik, Lisa, I was very excited when I when I recognized the the old man. First time I watched it, that voice just kept I could hear him saying something else in the back of my head and it didn't click until I watched it the second time. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I love him. I love, that's one of my top five favorite DS9 episodes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, his, his voice is just so cool. And something interesting I found out on IMDb about the the outfit that he's that, that he's wearing. It's a repurposed Borg outfit, but without all the extra yeah. poses and stuff all over it. That's why Sorak, you that got that, right? Like. I was right. I said it gave me Borg vibes. Yeah, I thought, I, I thought I was it was like, Borg doing it in the like <laughs> yeah, IMDb confirmed it, which I thought was cool. And the actor playing him, he's got he started acting in the 30s, which I think is so cool. 223 acting credits. I mean, the guy who's been in like all of like the gangster movies, he's been in two different Bond movies. It's very, very, very cool dude. I loved the the two scenes with Wesley and Brawl. The kid just has seems to attract like the rogue type dudes because I was getting very much the Okana hanging out with him, sort of very familiar sort of vibes. And we're all walking up and ganking his iPad out of his hand, like, oh, what you working on, kid? Yeah, I got a kid too. He's not so good at math. And then the scene just sort of ends, which is a little bit weird, but the the whole scene is just absolutely hysterical. And before I get to my limerick, Worf once again comes up against his single greatest enemy, and that is a door. (laughs) <laughs> at the beginning of the episode he still can't open the door and data once again has to come to his rescue <laughs> that will amuse me every single time it comes up but yeah poor poor Riker. i mean q, q, q and i both agree that there are many other things he could have done instead of killing her but he's sitting there at the end he's all broody and i decided for the for the limerick that perhaps after after he was done drinking his purple drink he went to counselor <laughs> troy had a little counseling session and she had him create some some poetry so this is what i decided he came up with why did she force me to do that she would not cease her relentless attack it had to end here i was forced to interfere her clan is now gone and part of the past He's created that, and now he can move on and flirt with somebody else. It rhymes, and it's verifiable. Uh, <laughs> very nice. Thank you very much, Carrie Schwent. What's up, Greg Kenzo out in Hawaii? What would you think of this one? This one, like everybody else said, it was like a middle-of-the-road episode. Um, some great things in it. Um, maybe I'll start out with the philosophy I took from it. Uh, not necessarily the one they were portraying um, throughout the episode, which is vengeance is not worth it. It's it's bad. Um, this is where the Akamar 3 leader says, the attempt may be futile. And Picard said, but there is so much to gain and so little to lose, to lose by the effort. This, is, this problem affects us all. It cannot be ignored. And that, I mean, we see that a lot throughout Star Trek, which is like just put in the effort even if it's a hopeless situation or it seems like a hopeless situation, put in the effort and you never know what the outcome could be. So, yeah. Uh, The rest of my notes are kind of just like a Rorschach test or the ink block test. You know what I mean? Like of things I got from this episode. Uh, We found out the setting uh, seven on a phaser is at least 2,314 degrees. All right. So that's pretty hot. It doesn't say Celsius or Fahrenheit. Um, pink phasers look a bit silly on camera, and I think that's why we don't see it very much going forward. 
Oh, Brule. I really liked his performance. Um, Joey Oresco is the actor's name. He kind of had like a, like, the role was written this way, right? But when they had, they had a close-up on him, and he was looking like pretty much directly into the camera, and he was giving his monologue. He had these like crazy eyes. Um, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, he did look like Scott Bakula's younger brother. Oh. Um, <laughs> pretty pretty badass, uh, straight out of Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome. I think he he has the same <laughs> jacket as as Mad Max with the football pad on one side. Um, let's see. But yeah, that was, I mean, that in itself was great. There was a little bit of softcore-esque, romance novel-esque writing in um, Utah and Riker's relationship. You know, um, that was, I'm not going to comment on that. But, but yeah, the femme fatale, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that was that was great that they had that in this, you know. Um, yeah, I liked um, the Golden Gate Bridge tattoo that Utah had on her face. You know, that was a cool <laughs> face tattoo. Warriors. Um, yeah. It was. It did really look like the Golden Gate Bridge. And I would, if I were to get a face tattoo, it would look something like that. Whatever. Go fund me. Let's um, do it. Make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. And well, the last thing is, uh, yeah, the ending is what really captivated me. Um, it, this episode didn't really grab me until the standoff between Utah and Riker. Um, it was like, okay, now I'm paying attention. You know, like, and I was like, oh, does, is Riker really going to murder the Utah right here? And then I was like, oh, wow, he vaporized her. You know, so that was, yeah, that was, that was pretty crazy to see in Star Trek. Because I had forgotten that. I had seen this movie before, but, yeah. Um, yeah, last thing I'll say is that I think this is our first space, space pirate episode, right? And that is a theme going forward. Maybe not. If you count the, um, who are the really, the kind of dumb guys? Pockleds. Like they play, Pockleds. They, they play dumb. They could be considered pirates. But and Okana too, a Okana. little bit. Okana, yeah. And like he reminded right, me of right. Okana and Dennis Madelon. Right. That's who I was. Yeah, oh, yes, yes, yeah. Sure, exactly. Dennis Madelon right. with the, uh, yeah. in the mirror universe or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. good nope. stuff thanks greg kenzo and when greg says i won't talk about that what he means is he will talk about it and things left unsaid uh, <laughs> <Totes>. <laughs> uh, thanks very much greg tj jackson bay is out in a, in missouri and he's wearing his be kind shirt what do you think of this one uh well it's <clears throat> uh an episode that that's an old favorite for me uh just because i remember watching it it's, I think it came on a lot when I was a kid or I had it on tape or something, probably recorded off a of TV. So so it's an old favorite and it was nice to revisit it. Um, and, you know, I picked up some things that I hadn't picked up before. Uh, but one that I have picked up before was a nice homage to uh, the original series uh, where when uh, Data scans the planet, he says, I'm picking up several small areas of thermal radiation and carbon dioxide emissions indicative of combustion. And Wesley's like, it's campfires, Data. <laughs> and Data's like, that, that's what I said. <laughs> and, um, you know, that was a nice homage to uh, the original series episode, uh, The Doomsday Machine, where Spock says, random chance seems to have been operated in our favor. And McCoy says, in, in plain non-Vulcan English, we were lucky. And Spock says, that's what I said, doctor. Uh, <laughs> so I it was a, a, a kind of a nice, you know, uh, mirroring of that conversation. Um, yeah. So I was watching this time, I was watching uh, this kind of journey that Utah is going through because we can see her, you know, as she you know, starting to pick up Riker's vibes that she's kind of starting to feel a little bit conflicted about, you know, what she's waited 50 something years to do, you know, to finish this, uh, this revenge for the uh, massacre of the Trelestas. 
Um, and so in the scene where she's uh, in Riker's quarters, you know, she's like, you know, I can't feel passion. Like she shut all of those things off so that she could be like single mindedly focused on the task that that she has given up her life to uh, to do. And so, um, you know, I think that was a, a very nice, you know, setup for the scene that we see um, later on where, you know, Riker, I think he, he doesn't want to have to kill her. He actually, you know, said like, don't, he's like, don't make me do this. He tried stunning her. It didn't work. Uh, and, and she's so, you know, single-mindedly devoted to, to what she has to do that she doesn't care. She's like, you know, if she can just touch this guy, then her job is done. So she throws herself at him and Riker kind of doesn't have a choice because in my mind, I'm like, why didn't he just stun her? I'm like, well, he tried like three times to stun her. <laughs> it didn't work. Um, and I don't know, maybe throw a body in between. I don't Everybody else was safe, but um but uh, you know, watching her kind of you know struggle with that as uh, you know she's recognizing and realizing maybe she even has the thought in her the back of her mind that you know for a second that you know it's not worth it like I can you know I can live a life I can be happy um, and and then she's like but I've waited like fifty something years. Uh, I also enjoyed, uh, you know, Riker's performance when when he realizes, you know, what's happening when he sees that picture and he's like fifty three years and she hasn't aged a day, and uh, like the close up on his face, I, I thought that was a, a, you know, really good. Do you think he was thinking like maybe I episode. should give her a chance? <laughs> <laughs> maybe he was thinking long term. He's like, well, now hang on a second. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, one thing I would have liked to have seen or heard a little bit more was uh, maybe a little bit more story on on uh, you know why these gatherers had to leave. Uh, at one point, Sovereign Marook says, "You know, hey, we need you back in our society," and I, I kind of would have liked to have, you know heard her say a little bit more about what what they could bring you know to the table being back at home versus like we just want you to come home because the Federation is tired of you you know, screwing around. Um, so that's what I have. More later. Excellent. Thank you very much. TJ Jackson Bay out in Missouri. All right. The Dark Lord, Chris McGee. What do you got for us today? Well, first of all, I did not notice any some kind of or some sort of in this episode unless someone else picked any up. No? Okay. Um, as far as the story goes, I really appreciate that they how they they were able to fit such a great deal of backstory into the you know limited time frame of this episode. But I think the story might have had a more impactful climax, or at least the mystery could have lasted longer. Perhaps even given a higher score on IMDb if we didn't see Utah murder Volnath early in the episode so that we don't know mm. who killed him, where the source of this, you know, uh, mole is or whatever. Um, and perhaps the, even that photo that's revealed at the end uh, during data's research, although by that time it probably wouldn't have been okay to reveal it, but yeah, I think that would have been a nice little suspense, you know, lasting throughout most of the episode. If they did, didn't show you Utah immediately as being the, the one, the murderer. Um, as far as the models go, um, this uh, is the second time that we've seen the model that Chogun's ship uses. It's reused in a few other episodes. Uh, the last time we saw it was as the pack led ship Mondor in Samaritan Snare. And this won't be the last time we see that model. It's very unique with that triangular shape and little nose that looks looks like it's pointing downward or so. Mm -hmm. So keep an eye out for that in the future. Another model we see is a nice close-up of the, the Type 2 phaser, as well as our only look at how to set the power level on it. I, th I think I thought it was uh, rather interesting. Um, another interesting thing was Riker's ploy of pretending to call for the Enterprise, which astute viewers, those that are really paying attention, will notice they didn't hear the communicator chirp because he never tapped his communicator. So, of course, 
that sets up the little, little counter ambush at, brilliant. afterward, that which was leads brilliant. lead. Absolutely. I love that. It leads into my memorable quote of the episode. I think everyone knows it by now. Your ambushes would be more successful if you bathe more often. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Warp said he doesn't like bathing because it's too much like, or doesn't like swimming because it's too much like bathing. Exactly. <laughs> Great stuff. Thank you very much, Dark Lord. Chris McGee, Allison Leach Hyde is here, also wearing a cool Be Kind shirt, uh, the Kenneth Mitchell variety. What did you think of this episode? This is an episode that I go, oh, yeah, this episode, whenever I'm five minutes into it. <laughs> like, what episode is this? And then it starts. I'm like, oh, yeah, this episode. So I I like the episode. I don't dislike it. I really like the lighting in this episode. They used a lot of colors and gels, which they don't usually do. I, I love the first scene being Borg green, even though we don't have the Borg in it. I'm like, that's cool. And then the Sovereign's dress is very gold, which is a, you don't usually see that amount of gold on one human on TV. And I thought it was quite striking. <laughs> And then we get the purple phaser fire during the ambush. I'm like, oh, this is great. We have so much color in this episode. And usually in Next Gen, you know, we have much more muted colors and it's all more more soft. So I, I really actually enjoyed that. I loved the ambush music for when Kiss arrived. <laughs> and <laughs> that was a, as soon as they all showed up, I'm like, oh, they were ambushed by Kiss. This is amazing. So... <laughs> Very much entertained and Amazing. loved that. And I was very impressed with Will Wheaton's spouting of techno babble for his math homework. I, that was just amazing. Just rolled right off the tongue, just got straight through it. And whenever, you know, Wesley's a little bit snarky with people, it always makes me happy. I'm like, oh, yeah, he is still 16. Like, thank you for still mm -hmm. being 16. Yep. That's pretty much it other than why did the stun setting not work after so many stuns that was pretty much my main question at the end like could we have at least mentioned this about you know when they talked about all the medical um enhancements she had to keep her from aging maybe they could have just kind of thrown something in there about yeah, yeah she's now like now she includes force fields yeah exactly mm -hmm. you know a little bit of extra there and one more little thing. Um, I loved all the little scenes with Deanna and Riker just showing their friendship, I thought was really nice. And when Uta comes and say, am I interrupting? And Deanna's like, no, you're not. I'm leaving. <laughs> and just the look she gives Riker, I'm like, yep, yeah, they're good friends. We know where this is going to go in the end, but I'm so glad they're friends. So that's that's what I like about the episode. That is a good friend. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, Allison Leach. Hi, Jake's final take. Sirac Lofton, what are your final thoughts on this one here? Um, the Brule character, I, I did get Dennis Madelone vibes from him, um, and I also got Kurt Russell vibes. So, oh, you know, yeah, that, that kind of popped out. To me. Yeah, and um, <laughs> I noticed the Trekism in this episode. When they said a regalian phaser rifle, right? Mm. So normally they do it for food items or something, but this time it was for a phaser rifle. Um, Trelestas sounds like uh, medical commercials, you know, like you see <laughs> tra 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 Trelestas. Nice. Uh, with like 45 <laughs> seconds of disclaimers yeah. after, right? Side effects yes. include. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> this will kill you. So I, I, won't be <laughs> I won't be surprised if I see a Trelesta coming out one of these days. Um, also got Gold Ducat vibes from the uh, Bolnoth character, uh, the Borg dressed guy in the beginning. There was some miniature Gold Ducat moments. I had to pause and say, wait a minute, is this the first time we saw Mark? Um, but uh, it wasn't. Um, and then here, I, my my little nitpick was that this character 
uh, waiting 53 years to get revenge, finally in the presence of the person they're trying to get. And you're waiting for what exactly? What cue are you waiting for? The, mm. the, the brandy cue? What, uh, what cue are you waiting for? If I've been waiting my entire life to get close to a person and here they are directly in front of me, I'm just going to do it. I'm not going to wait for some cue or I, I don't care about the consequences as long as I get you. And I, mm -hmm. I just didn't, I didn't believe that that was realistic enough for me. Um, waiting for the moment. And, you know, she walked by him a few times. Um, just, just do it. Little hand on the shoulder. Yeah. I mean, it, it wouldn't have taken much. So I don't understand what, what, what cue she was waiting for after the negotiations are finished. I mean, if I've dedicated my life to this one moment to be in the same room with you, to get my hands on you, I'm going to, as soon as I get within touching distance, going to yeah. get it done. So that was not believable for me. Uh, neither was Riker's response of disintegrating her either. So I, I just don't, that didn't sit well with me. Um, and I kind of feel like she was entitled to her revenge, in my opinion, a little bit. If you exterminated her entire bloodline, uh, this is the guy that's guilty of that, if, according to the story He's, he didn't oh it was well, his ancestors that did it the sins of the father <laughs> yeah. yeah i i i'm kind of one of sometimes i'm rooting for the villain and in this case if you if you did some bad stuff it felt like you needed some bad stuff to come back to you i'm sorry so i i, I wasn't that upset i wasn't that upset that she was on that path sorry they made her a sympathetic character sorry yeah point that out Great no, stuff. That's my final take. Mm hmm. She was sympathetic. I liked her. I liked all the characters, though, except one. War. <laughs> Just kidding. All right. Uh, that's it for us, everybody. But thank you to uh, Melissa, Jason, Carrie, Greg, TJ, Chris, and Allison for myself, Melissa, Sorok, and Mr. Aaron Eisenberg. Thank you all very much for hanging out with us. And until next time, always remember the seventh rule.